Hey guys, Ryan Earnhardt here from creativesoundlab.tv. Today we're hanging out live with Ian Shepard. We're going to be talking about uh, mastering, uh, here from Creative home mastering. And um, if you could just do a, me a favor and just make sure that uh, we can hear you. If you can just put uh, a quick hello in the chat and let me know where you're from. And I'm just going to sort out an audio thing that I'm dealing with here. But just let me know that you're there. Let me know that you can hear me. And uh, we'll get started in just a minute. We're not seeing any messages uh, yet, but um, so the chat box is to the right hand side of the YouTube video. If you guys are watching it, I'll drop a message and say hello. We're not seeing any messages uh, yet, but um, so oh, no, I'm hearing myself. To the right hand side of the YouTube video. If you guys are watching it, I'll drop a message. Okay, now I see a message from Randy. Hey there, hearing you just fine. Randy from Big R Music and Post Production on the Jersey Shore. Hey, Randy. Ryan, how are you doing with your audio issue? Was that me? Because uh, it was uh, I was hearing myself coming back. Yeah, I'm getting that too. I'm not sure why. Okay, you probably have YouTube open in a browser tab somewhere. That was what I did. If you uh, if you open the YouTube link somewhere, it'll actually be playing in the background. Hangouts are great, but they're, <laughs> they're always a bit messy. Okay, I think I I think I found the issue. <laughs> okay, I think we got this. So, uh, Ian, how's the chat looking? Uh, good. Yeah, we've got uh, Randy from Jersey Shore. Shane is saying hello. Awesome. Justin Carty, uh, Sean Brockman, sounds good. Let's get rocking. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ian is uh, a real informative uh, tutorial creator, uh, masterclass um, educator. Um, he does a lot of really cool stuff, and it's not just in the mastering front, but it's man, there's just so much to learn on what he's doing and what he's demonstrating, and really exploring. I've I've learned some really cool stuff in the past couple of days that I uh, I thought I had down and. Um, through Ian's tutorials, I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it applies to me in so many different levels, even for recording and even for mixing. And so we're just going to be uh, talking about mastering today, home mastering. Um, can you, you know, what are the things you can do yourself? And um, just also answering some questions about mastering. Uh, so Ian, uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. I really look forward to this conversation. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It's great to be here. Yeah, so um, why don't you just uh, do a quick introduction of, uh, I think a lot of people kind of know what mastering is, but let's just kind of kick it off just to provide a foundation. Uh, what is mastering? And um, maybe some terminology that is used around mastering, such as the levels and how levels are currently measured according to like broadcast standards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I always like to, I mean, the really short answer is that there are two really short answers. Uh, mastering is making the music sound the best it can, um, it can the best it can possibly be, and uh, it's creating a production master. So back in the day, that used to meant maybe um, cutting a vinyl uh, master. Um, then it was creating a CD master or a cassette master. And these days, it probably means, uh, you know, uh, a suitable format for uploading to all the different streaming services and maybe CD as well, uh, depending. And the other little analogy that I like to use is to sometimes say that it's a little bit like uh, Photoshop for audio. So, you know, if you take a digital photograph, um, you maybe 
um, somebody photobombs you or you have some mustard on your chin or uh, there's a power line in the back of your beautiful landscape shot that you took, you know, you might pull that into Photoshop and kind of use the clone tool to get rid of those things. You might tweak the color and the contrast and the brightness. You might change the, the cropping, the shape of it, the aspect ratio. You might zoom in a bit. And audio mastering is basically the same thing, right? You can you can remove clicks, bumps, thumps, pops, faults, hiss, buzz, all that kind of stuff. If there's any that's kind of left over from the mix process, you can tweak the dynamics and the loudness, which is kind of like contrast and brightness. You can uh, adjust the EQ, which is a bit like adjusting the color balance of a photograph. Um, you know, zooming in and cropping it is maybe like choosing how loud it's going to be, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the way that I like to explain it. And I guess the other thing to say is that it's, I always think mixing is about balancing the channels in a mix to make a song, whereas mastering is like mixing the songs in an album to make an album or a collection of songs, a playlist or whatever it might be. Um, and you you can actually literally lay out the, the tracks um, in a DAW um, in that way. So sort of moving on to the next part of your question, which is you know, how it kind of works. What I like to do is uh, you export stereo mixes of all of the songs. So you, you don't have access to all the individual tracks or any of the effects and that kind of stuff anymore. I bring all of those into one session. I like to use Wavelab, um, which where I can lay the songs out in a line and I can put individual processing directly onto each song. But if you were using something like Logic or uh, Cubase or maybe, I don't know what the Pro Tools has clip effects. I know that Reaper does, but you could literally give each song its own channel in the mixer and you kind of lay them out diagonally across the screen or however you're looking at it. Um, so you can have separate processing on every song, which is crucial. Uh, one of the things that bugs me is when people think that mastering is just about choosing a setting for a co collection of songs and running everything through on the same setting. It's, I mean, that might improve things. You could probably increase the loudness and whatever, but that's the real magic is when you, you individually tweak each song and you balance them all against each other to create a kind of a cohesive listening experience so that they all flow through from one to the next. Um, and I mean, the actual process of that is 80, 90% of the time is really simple. Um, I like to say mastering isn't easy, but it is simple. Um, so you're literally talking about adjusting the level, then EQ, maybe compression, and probably a little bit of limiting to prevent any clipping distortion. And, and that's genuinely it. I mean, I even go, I sometimes do talks in colleges um, where afterwards I do a little workshop and I kind of do a, a mastering session where the students bring stuff in on a USB drive and I just work with whatever DAW they have and whatever speakers they have, which is sometimes interesting. <laughs> um, but um, And I just master the songs, which literally means adjust the level. I have a limiter at the end to, I'm not going for super loudness or anything like that. Um, and uh, EQ balance, and that's it. So just EQ level and limiting. And you can you can take, you know, I mean, you think about it, in a, in a music college, you're going to get, you know, one guy's going to be doing folk, somebody else is going to be doing hardcore EDM, somebody else is going to have death metal, right? <laughs> There's probably somebody doing jazz. Um, so it's the most bizarre kind of compilation album in the world. And you, you put those songs next to each other to begin with, and they just sound like they're on different planets. And by the end of it, they kind of fit together and certainly much, much better. So that's that's the kind of the overall process. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, you say EQ, compression. Obviously, these are things we can do while we're mixing. We can put EQ on the, the stereo bus. But mastering, I mean, why is it more valuable to do as a separate process? Is it? Is it to gel those songs together to make them work as an album? Is is that the main reason why? Yeah, I would. I mean, one thing is that if you have a one is a practicality thing. Um, you know, if it's pretty tough to get. Well, it, one of the one of the advantages to having all the songs in one session is you can flick between them, right? Since you're trying to find this balance and get them to kind of fit together, get a flow through to make a. a a really pleasing listening experience. If you have yeah. all of your songs in different sessions, that's going to be a nightmare because it'll take 20 seconds for the song to load. You know, um, you could maybe lay all of the songs out somehow and, and uh, get them all in the same session, but I think that would be a complete nightmare. So there's a that's a practical issue. But for me personally, I just, I mean, I've done plenty of mixing and recording over the years. I don't have the the mental capacity to 
kind of focus on is the kick drum right in relation to the bass is the are those bvs panned right do i need more reverb and also think about the overall dynamics and the overall eq and uh the overall loudness so that's a kind of a, a different practical um reason but I, I i'd go further than that i think it's genuinely valuable to i think a big thing about mastering is the mindset so an advantage of using a professional mastering engineer is that you get uh, a, an objective kind of third party opinion, right? So you've been sweating blood over these things for months or years. Um, it's really easy to get locked in to kind of persuade yourself that it's okay that there's a boomy note in that bass line because that's the instrument and you, you know, you kind of make excuses for the way that things sound. Whereas a mastering engineer who never heard it before puts it up and goes, well, that's a boomy bass note. I'm going to EQ that out. Um, so that just difference of approach and that kind of hearing it first impressions doing what they think is is valuable that's really good um and also you would hope that the engineer has really good equipment a really good listening environment and a ton of experience um so all of those things are, but if you want to master music yourself or even just kind of you know get it closer to the mastered stuff that you're the people you're playing it to are listening to whether that's your friends or you're trying to get a gig or you're trying to get a deal or whatever um it's really hard um, to, to to shift that mindset. So that's one of the things I talk about on the on the course. Um, and actually, I have a podcast um, called The Mastering Show. And there's a, one of the early episodes is about that. It's the three M's of mastering. It's metering, monitoring, and mindset. Um, and then the other thing is it's really hard because you've, you're still using the same monitoring. So if there's a limitation of the speakers that you have or there's something strange with the acoustics in the room or not even strange, just normal with the acoustics in your room and they're not spot on, you're going to hear the same things that you heard when you were mixing and you won't be able to compensate for them. So, you know, it's it's a real challenge. I've forgotten what your question was. I'm sorry. Oh, just, just the value of having mastering as a separate process from mixing. Right. So I think you take all of that that I just said, I think it's really valuable to... Like if you're going to master your own stuff, um, one thing you could do is just move into a completely different space. So, because we all have our rooms that we spend all our time in, you know, the cave, um, but you probably listen to a ton of music somewhere else. So it could be the car or it could be, I think mastering in a car is probably not an option, but if you have a decent hi-fi system, you know, uh, set up in your living room, maybe you bring everything in on a laptop and sit in there and do some work in there even if you just listen and make notes and then go back to the studio and think well do i ag still agree with that another thing you can do is get another a really good pair of headphones maybe with some correction software to get them even flatter to give you that extra perspective but also simple stuff like taking some time so don't kind of dive straight into the mastering after you finished mixing give it a day or two or maybe even a week if you can so that you come to the songs somewhat fresh i mean everybody knows that right you you know you've been working on something for a couple of hours you go out make a coffee come back in hit play and you're like oh my god the kick drum is 60 db too quiet or whatever it is you know that's the whole mindset thing um and i think that's the value of i mean a getting all the songs in a single session so you can quickly skip between them um you kind of you it, it's one of those things, you know, lots of people talk about the advantages of limitations in lots of ways. You know, if, if you're mastering and you've only got stereo files, you can't tweak the kick drum level or the, the vocals or whatever it is, but sometimes you can make it seem like you have um, using the right balance of EQ and compression. Um, so in some ways having those limitations, sometimes pe whenever people say, would you like stems, you know, like keys, guitars, vocals, bass, that kind of thing. I always say no to, to begin with. Um, every once in a while it's necessary to use stems but i prefer to work with the stereo mix because then i know that's the that's the closest the the artist or the producer got to what they wanted to achieve and yeah. it's up to me to take that to the next level rather than trying to sort of rewrite anything if you're mastering your own stuff um or maybe mastering things for friends perhaps then obviously well and even if you're a professional mastering engineer there's always the option of discussing the possibility of a mix revision um if there's you know, if there's something that's like, uh, like if there's a ton of sibilance in the vocals, that can be really hard to deal with in mastering without also affecting the drums and the percussion and, you know, guitars and stuff. Um, so that's a case where I might go back and see whether the mix can be tweaked. Um, but <laughs> 
quite often by the time it gets to me it's going to go to the plant tomorrow um and anyway they they're kind of utterly sick of it by that point so it's just like right. no, we'll do what you can um so yeah i think the, there is a real value in a separate process even if you're mastering your own stuff um you know or, or not using a professional engineer yeah let's let's talk about this perspective bit because um you you really taught me something huge and and you you played a track for me that was only at a half a db uh different and i swore that there was differences in the actual mastering job i swore that i could tell a difference in the low end in the kick i could tell a difference in the compression even and then you revealed to me that there was nothing different the only difference was the volume and the perspective i just didn't have a a good perspective and it threw off the entire um operation and so maybe you could talk to that about how do you know what you're even hearing and like it was just this amazing eye-opening experience that like all of a sudden you can take something that um sounds amazing but if you level match then all of a sudden it puts it on an even playing field and then you can really hear the difference of oh this this mix actually has not quite as good of low end as my own mix you know or my own master and it really really just gives you i think you use the term x-ray vision on what you're actually hearing and what you're actually comparing it was super eye-opening it's it's an amazing thing um i mean it the the x-ray vision thing is what i say about the plugin i developed with meter plugs um perception which i mean the whole idea of that is it's an automated loudness matching plugin so you it measures the loudness before you've done your mastering process it masters measures the volume afterwards and automatically matches them and sync compensates them so you can bypass everything with one click um so it was my idea to make that plugin and that's um, that's huge that's such a great tool well th thank you i mean it, it is really cool and what i was going to say is it, it amazes even me how useful it is <laughs> which <laughs> I, you know I'm, I'm not being literally the the number of times so you know you, you work on something you master it you get everything set up the way you think and then it's like okay but it's a bit louder than it was so i might be being fooled by the extra loudness so i'll just i mean you don't have to use a plugin you can you can measure the loudness you can match it by hand which is the way i always used to do it um back in the day you'd have the mix on one fader and the, the mastered version on the other fader and you just turn the mastered version down until they sounded comparable and flick between them um but however you do it the number of times you get to that and you're like okay yeah i pushed that too hard or you know that i've over bright that's it's not sounding the way they intended anymore it's i got carried away with this or i missed that and it that stuff gets revealed by matching the loudness um i mean just really quickly the the reason for that is um a psychoacoustic effect called the fletcher munson curve or the equal loudness curve they call it the smile curve um and it's the reason that um amps quite often domestic hi-fi amps have a a loudness button that you press for when you're listening at low levels actually uh, i'm showing my age there modern amps will cal will will compensate it for it automatically as at every level you turn the the volume control down because what happens is when something is quieter we hear less bass and less treble um the sound hasn't changed but our ears or our brains perceive it differently um and it might be uh an evolutionary thing where basically we have evolved to pay more attention to the saber-toothed tiger that's breathing down our neck than the one that's over there watching the herd yeah. of gazelles right because stuff that's close is potentially dangerous and therefore there is a an evolutionary advantage to paying attention to it so our, our brain makes it sound more interesting if it's closer that might be it maybe not um but whatever the reason it's a fact so what you i mean you shouldn't feel bad about being fooled by that trick because it's a mean trick right because half a db is a really small difference in loudness yeah um, but but i mean it, i've spent a long time trying to train my brain to you know judge things even a lot like you know judge a sound if it's loud or judge a sound if it's soft like I'm, I'm pretty good at judging sounds you know like it was amazing how much it threw me off well i mean it's small enough that you don't immediately think oh there's a loudness difference if it was three dbs you'd go well that's quieter right so yeah. it's, it's small enough that you and 
but but you're right and i mean i get fooled by it as well and it, and it's literally what i do day in day out one of the main things about mastering is deciding how loud am i going to make this and how am i going to make it that loud uh and yeah i mean i a client will come back and say oh i compared it with this and i think it doesn't sound as as and i listen i go oh crap they're right and then i think oh well hang on you know that's coming off of spotify and i'm listening to this here i need to just double check the loudness and i match the loudness and i go oh no it's it's good i'm fine you know we are both just being fooled by the difference in loudness i call it uh, the loudness deception um yeah it's it's really powerful um so yeah i mean understanding how that works i mean it's why one of the things i teach first in the course uh, the home mastering course is uh that you want to the first thing to do is get the level roughly right and it's not going to be perfect but so when i do that demo in colleges you know the workshop the limiter is there to prevent any clipping distortion first thing to do is just either bring the channel fader up or turn the clip gain up or however you want to do it you could use a, a gain plugin lift the level till it's roughly where you want it and to know that you have to know what you're aiming for but we could cover that separately um and then you apply a bit of eq and then you might think about the dynamics and it's just i mean if you think about it it has to be that way because if you don't turn it up first let's say you listen to it and you go oh i'm gonna have a bit more bass and a bit more treble and oh let's have some compression that sounds great okay now it needs to be louder so you turn it up your perception of that's why the plugin is called perception your perception of how it sounds completely changes because of this the smile curve the equal loudness curve right we hear it differently because you turned it up and you have to go back and rev your chances are you'll it'll be overhyped in the bass and the treble because you were hearing less when it was quiet so you pushed it up and you bring the loudness up and suddenly it's all wrong so it's just i mean it's not the end of the world but it's it's right. much faster and more efficient to do loudness first so i kind of talk about it as this kind of loop where you do level eq compression and then back to and think again about the level because when you adjust the eq and the compression you might change how loud it seems um so at that point you do those two processes you think okay i have to listen to the loudness okay now i want to turn it up a little bit or down a little bit but that then changes the way you hear the eq so then you have to tweak the eq again and then you treat and you just kind of go around in circles in this loop and the idea is you hone in on the ideal setting um you know and with practice you can get pretty pretty quick at it the first first few times you do it it takes you about four or five hours to get a song right but you know it it improves over time um yeah so yeah i mean it, it it's and it, it i mean the whole thing about mastering amazes me there's not you didn't ask this but it you know even after over 20 years doing it still astonishes me the impact you can have just by working on a stereo mix and just with a little bit of eq and compression um you know forget all the other bells and whistles um it, it's amazing that it yeah that you that that's how it works but yeah yeah well let's uh let's get some questions here um let's see here oh we have a ton of comments in the chat yeah yeah we really do so um let's see here what's the current status of the loudness war any quick comments on that okay so i would i i always when people ask me that i say that the war has been won uh but somebody needs to tell the generals <laughs> <laughs> um so i mean i'm sure everybody watching knows the loudness war is this because of the what i've just been talking about the temptation is to push things louder because you get kind of you sound better for free if you like the trouble is that only works until you run out of headroom now if you're talking about a pa or uh you know even a home hi-fi system you can just turn the volume up and up and up and I mean, eventually your speakers will start to crap out, but it's probably fine. But in digital, we have the zero dB FS limit, right? Um, and the closer you push the loudness up to that limit, the less room there is for the music to, to um, for the waves to exist, to do their thing. Um, so you have to start managing the dynamics. If you just push it straight up, it'll go over, it'll clip. So you probably have to start using a limiter. And then if you use too much aggressive limiting, it's not gonna sound great. So then you start, you start using compression. And you know we've now got to the point where it's completely normal. So Miley Cyrus's last album had a difference in between the peak, the zero dB FS, and the loudness of four dB. Wow. <laughs> right? When you and when you think that uh, you know a CD has ninety six dBs available, and that you know a classic 
rock tracks for i mean nirvana uh, never mind you know the original master of that had something like 12 to 14 dbs difference between the peak and the loudness yeah. um which by the way you're asking about the terminology that's called the peak to loudness ratio um it's a ratio because it's measured in dbs we don't have to get into that but yeah i mean back in the day 14 12 10 maybe for for all of those so why miley has which is kind of that was a kind of folk pop thing why that has to be up at minus four i mean even like taylor swift minus six you know um so that's the loudness war and the the really frustrating thing about it is that these days it's pointless because just imagine that miley cyrus tune uh it's uh, uh compare it with oh there was a metal album recently by avenged sevenfold um really aggressive stuff um produced by Andy Wallace, um, mastered by Bob Ludwig. And I think the levels on that were about minus 12. So Miley is going to be 8 dBs louder than that if you just put wow. the, one, one CD in followed by the other one, right? So you've got aggressive metal, raw metal, and folk pop. <laughs> pat, yeah. You know, whatever. Um, that's on CD. If you check out those songs on YouTube, Miley will not sound louder because the number one source of complaints from people using YouTube and Spotify and Tidal and Pandora and all these services uh, and actually broadcast TV and radio is sudden changes of loudness. I mean, nobody likes, you know, listening to a song and suddenly being blasted by the next one. Nobody wants Miley Cyrus to be 80 dBs louder than Avenged Sevenfold. Yeah. Um, and correspondingly, if you're listening to one and suddenly the level drops and you can't hear it and you're in the car or you're, you know, riding a bike or whatever it is, just out walking, it's just annoying to have to keep adjusting it. So... All of these services measure the loudness one way or another, um, and then they try and even it out. So if there's super loud stuff, they will turn it down, um, which means the loudness was pointless in the first place. Um, Boom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and and that's why I always say that the war is over because, yeah. you know, you can't win. It's like you've been disarmed. Um, but... Somebody needs to tell the generals, right? And by the generals, I just mean whoever's calling the shots on any one particular project, you know? I don't know whether it was Miley or whether it was her manager or whether it was her engineer. Somebody, I I, I forget it, I, I laid it out. There's like seven stages between somebody coming up with a hook and, and it actually getting out into the world. And there could be seven different people at every one of those stages, you know? There could be a recording engineer, a mixing engineer, a producer, uh, yeah, a manager, a label boss, all the rest of it. If any one of those people in that chain says, shouldn't this be louder? Suddenly, everybody else gets the fear of, oh, if we don't do this, it's not going to sell or it's not going to sound right or whatever. And up up the loudness goes. So, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of A&R execs, you know, getting sent 50, 100 songs a day. They just pull the stuff in off the Dropbox link or whatever it is, and they just hit preview, you know, space bar on a Mac to preview it, listening on a laptop. If it's... 4 dBs, 5, 6 dBs quieter. The fear is they will just reject it out of hand. And I, I think that's a genuine fear, you know? Um, so people are making stuff super loud still to kind of avoid that risk. And also because it feels cool to be louder than everybody else. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, this, um, especially when you're fooled by the loudness deception. So you don't notice all the damage that's been done making it loud. It just sounds huge. Um but then they upload it to YouTube and it suddenly sounds weak. And you kind of think, well, they, they, they're like, well, what happened there? Um, so that's, that's quite a long answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a question about, uh, can you uh, recommend some affordable mastering plugins, preferable, something that is user-friendly? And this kind of tags into something that I wanted to touch on is, um, you know, you have this, this kind of approach that uh, you can... Um, you know, kind of go in and using just some basic tools, get the job done and take a track, you know, and make it way better than it was before. Um, I know you have a master class that does exactly this. It's not in a fancy studio. You do it in a, a home environment and you use some basic tools that are, are really powerful. I know one of them is like the VU meter that you use to, to level match. Uh, so what are your uh, kind of favorite tools that you like to uh, use and mastering and are there any that are affordable yeah i mean it depends what you call affordable um, right. 
but yeah there are a ton i mean so one that kind of most people agree isn't affordable there's a new there's a, a plug-in version of um ah, i forgot the name of the company who did it the orange eq um which has just come out and it's it's a thousand dollars for a plugin um and you even have to buy a 50 dollars dongle to to try it to to do the trial i think everybody agrees that that's probably too expensive um but i mean i really like the fab filter stuff um which you know it's not cheap but it's not ridiculously expensive um so the pro q is fantastic eq um the pro mb is great multiband the pro l is a great limiter um you know the, i haven't used ozone for a long time but the stuff in ozone uh, is very capable you know you there's a lot of people doing great work with that um again i haven't used t-rex in a long time but i mean the truth is these days there are a ton of great options um and you could probably even get great results using the stock plugins in a daw at this point you know um maybe not the, the ultimate best results you could wish for but you know great and probably good enough depending on what you're aiming for um so i mean the sort of unofficial tagline of the course is it ain't what you use it's the way that you use it so yeah when you come to like my favorite plugins they are mostly meters um <laughs> So, so generally so 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 i made one called dynameter that measures the peak to loudness ratio that i mentioned of the music in real time and shows that as a display so you can see when you're pushing stuff too hard um there's perception which is not really a meter but the level matching tool that i use and i use both of those in literally every job that i do um but if you're just interested in sort of dipping your toe into all of this there's a ton of um affordable and even free loudness meters uh the so recently with the there's this thing called the loudness unit has been defined um so loudness units lu and actually lufs for loudness units full relative to full scale um they have developed for broadcast so they're not perfect but they're pretty good and they they try to take that whole loudness thing into effect that the, the curve that i mentioned to uh to compensate so that because the problem with an old-fashioned sort of rms meter and even a vu meter that i'm going to talk about is that they react more strongly to bass so you can get kind of get fooled by by that and loudness unit meters are less vulnerable to that but yeah i was trained 20 years ago uh using a vu meter a needle meter um and the funny thing was i so i i worked for 15 years in the studio where i was trained and then i left to set up my own company and i was dry hiring their room and then they went bust the studios got ripped out all the gear was sold i tried to get in and get some of the gear i couldn't um so then i was for a while in this kind of situation of just making do with what i had and i suddenly didn't have a vu to a vu meter and i kind of felt lost um and then after i don't know maybe six or eight months i found uh, this really cool emulation of a vu meter uh, which is made by a company called clang helm with a k um and it's the it, the VUMT is what it's called, which I think is short for VU meter. So the name of it is the Klanghelm Vumped, right? And if you don't want a plugin called the Klanghelm Vumped, then there's something wrong with you as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, when you add into that the fact that it only costs 22 euros, so that's about $25, um, it's incredible. Um, there's a slightly more expensive version, the deluxe version, but so I highly recommend that. But there's also uh, Waves did one that they gave away for free for a while. And I think there's a bunch of people who do VU meters. So the thing i really love about vu meter is it's really sensitive around about zero it's only got like two or three dbs of headroom above zero and if you look at the scale it goes all the way back down to here kind of almost to what you would think is naught and it's just minus 20 or minus 30 right so there's another 40 or 50 dbs below that so it's really good for hitting a target which is what you're aiming for in mastering so my advice on the course is calibrate the vu meter so that zero is equal to minus 11 on a, a, a you know with zero at the top and a db scale going down and then when you're mastering also so when you first turn up that first track to get it roughly right if you get it so that uh it's averaging around zero the loudness is going to be kind of in the right ballpark um and it's i i do a demo in those classes that i talked about where i just i turn the monitoring down and i just go through a match by eye so that it's averaging over zero and then we listen to them and they're usually about right um so super simple um super cheap and uh, i know you asked me before we uh started this what i mean by averaging 
So what I mean is uh, find the loudest part of the song. The if the needle put needle pushes up to plus one or plus two for kind of I mean just imagine there's a there's a four to the floor kick drum uh you know or, or just a just a heavy drum beat in there if the kick drum pushes up to plus one plus two you're fine uh and if it dips down a little bit because there's plenty of variety there that's okay too but you want it to kind of be generally hovering around about that zero point if the needle is consistently down it's probably too quiet if it's consistently pegged it's too loud and that's why it's useful that it's so sensitive around about the zero right because you only have to go a couple of dbs too loud and the needles peg and you only have to go a couple of dbs too quiet and it kind of it looks really limp <laughs> um yeah. so yeah that's that's the the value of it um and yeah you do that for the loudest sections um the reason i say plus two is just that what the point where it hits plus three that's that's the maximum so you can't tell at that point where it would have gone higher i mean you kind of can tell because you can tell how hard the needle hits it right um, but yeah it's it's just a really uh yeah easy to use so i have you know i have my dynamiter meter and i have loudness meters um two or three loudness meters um you know there's ones that show the loudness graph over time so you can see a kind of a shape of the loudness of the song but i still watch the vu meter all the time and it, maybe that's just because i'm I've been doing it for so long but it's what i teach on the course and the, the feedback i get from people is that they find it really helpful as well and i think it's that sensitivity thing yeah yeah somebody was commenting in the comments and it was it was actually a great comment he said um you know i'm not trying to be a smart ass but use your ears you know like um almost like uh, we were getting caught up in the gear and the plugins and what's interesting is that um having the right tools enables you to train and use your ears better it's it's again it's all about almost the basics it comes back around to what am i hearing how can i level match these two tracks to fairly compare them and actually know what i'm listening to and it it really is helping to train your ears and you know it's it's a vu meter isn't as sexy as something else but it can be everything because you don't know what you're hearing if you don't actually know how loud something is and how to actually compare. I think I think you're absolutely right about training, right? I I, I probably I'm not saying I'd be comfortable, but I'm sure I could master very effectively without any of this the, the visual stimuli. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're just really helpful. I mean, it was really helpful to me when I started out. You know, it's having that guideline. You know. Um, and the other thing is you you none of these things are perfect so you have to learn how to uh interpret what you're hearing and i mean i said it's a disadvantage of rms and vu meters that they're really sensitive to bass but it actually can be kind of an advantage because if you have a song where that it doesn't have enough bass because i it doesn't or it's not balanced across the frequency spectrum because our ears are really sensitive in the 2k region um it's probably going to sound plenty loud. You know, if we turn it up anymore, it's going to start to be uncomfortable. But the VU meter or the RMS meter is going to be low. So you've got a clue there immediately. There's something weird, right? It's feeling loud enough, but it's not hitting hard enough. And the needles are low. Oh, maybe it hasn't got enough bass, right? Maybe. And so you can learn something. The converse applies. If the needles are pegging, but you keep wanting to push it up louder and louder, maybe there's too much bass in there, right? And the the... You need to address the EQ. I mean, I'd say the same thing about um, analyzers. I have a course called Home Mastering EQ, um, which is a kind of a real focused deep dive on using EQ specifically and mastering. Um, and uh, what was I going to say about Home Mastering EQ? Uh, oh, okay. So I recommend you use an analyzer. Um, there's one, there's a free one by, um, can't remember, Span, Voxengo which I think comes bundled in with Cubase these days. Um, which And you, I recommend you tweak some of the settings so that you kind of have fairly slow averaging display so it gives you a, a global. Because when I started out, the analyzer I had only had eight bands. Yeah. Uh, you know, these days you can do it down to the hertz. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's useful. Again, it's like that, that kind of overview thing. The whole mastering process is about taking a step back and seeing it from a, a long distance. I'm not saying anybody should ever decide what something should sound like based on what that analyzer looks like. Um, because it is, it's all about how it sounds and how it feels and whether it makes you want to smile or laugh or dance or cry or whatever. But when you're learning this stuff 
And if you're not quite sure whether your room and your speakers are completely reliable and trustworthy, you know, is that the right thing to have done? Or why is it not translating when I take it out into the world? It can be really helpful to just calibrate it. You know, if you're looking at it and the frequency response is flat, but you're not hearing enough, you're hearing a big dip in the bass at 70 hertz, you've probably got a null from the room in your mixing position and you maybe want to try moving the speakers a bit or listening on headphones to kind of get in the zone or adding some acoustic treatment, whatever it is. So it's, yeah. So about that though, is uh, we actually have a question about, um, you know, what do you think uh, mixing? We can also say, you know, mastering or just getting perspectives with headsets only and ways to correct the effects of, of listening on headphones. Uh, do you have any advice or plugins for headset mixing? Um, so, I mean, w one thing is I definitely, I'm personally not comfortable mixing or mastering purely on headphones. Um, but I interviewed a guy for the podcast, Glenn Schick, who mastered, um, uh, I've forgotten the artist's name. It was billboard number one. And he's, wow. his mastering studio, he has a, a really expensive pair of headphones, but um, it was, yeah, it was the most streamed album in its first week ever. And he mastered it on headphones and a laptop. Um, wow. Which maybe tells you something about another question that's common, which is whole by in the box versus out in the box. He, that's not kind of normal, but um, he's obviously very successful with that. So, yeah, I mean, I have uh, HD 650s, Sennheisers, which are pretty common. They're not the, the best headphone in the world, but they're, they're pretty good. And I've um, experimented with the Sonarworks software. Um, there's, there's a few out there. Uh, when I first tried it, they, they ship it with a, with an average setting, um, for that model of headphone. And I kind of listened to it. I was like, ah, I'm not sure about this. Um, but they persuaded me to get the headphones calibrated. So I've now got a custom profile for that exact pair of headphones. And that made all the difference. Um, wow. so, and, and the way I'm judging that is I'm just, I have a playlist of stuff that I've mastered over the years. I know exactly what it's supposed to sound like. When I was listening before, I was kind of like, oh, I'm not quite sure about this. And now I listen to it, I go, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so that's the, the great thing about headphones is they take the room out of the equation. Because right? yeah. it doesn't matter how good your monitors are, if the room uh, has some unhelpful buildups and uh, frequencies where you're not hearing enough, that can completely color your impression of what you're hearing. And the, the headphones, if they're good enough, and if they have a flat frequency response, will just get rid of that. So it gives you another really useful, even if you just kind of listen for about five or 10 minutes to get your head in the right zone, and then you go back to the monitors, um, that can be really helpful. And something like Sonarworks, uh, you know, can be can be really helpful for doing that. Um, the other tip that I would have, <coughs> excuse me, is to use reference tracks. So, you know, something that sounds fantastic to you everywhere else, bring it into the studio, take a listen and see how it sounds there. If it sounds wrong, it's probably something wrong in the studio. Uh, you know, there's, there's this weird thing where we all set ourselves up with this, you know, you get to the point where ah, I've got a room where I can, where I can mix or I can, or you, maybe you have a proper studio. Um, and another piece of advice I give people is just to listen to everything in there. Always have music on, even when you're like soldering cables or doing your accounts or answering emails or whatever, just have music on because over time your brain will learn what it sounds like in there. If you never listen to anything else in the studio, how do you know what, how your music compares with what's out there? If you bring reference tracks in, you can make that comparison um, and get a real perspective. And, you know, I mean, another thing you can do with Sonarworks, by the way, is they do a version that uh, where you put up a mic and you measure the room and it tries to correct for problems in the room. I'm not, I always believe in fixing it at the source. So I would say if there's a problem with the room, move the speakers, get some acoustic treatment, deal with it that way as much as you can before you try the software. But if you measure the response of the room and it shows you a big, dip at 70 80 hertz whatever it is that tells you something right that's something you can then try to fix and you can then run the test again and see whether you did improve it prove it or not um one other thing about reference tracks is if you're going to do that make sure you turn them down um because most stuff still the majority of stuff these days is mastered really really loud so if you compare that especially to a mix it's going to be really depressing because the loudness deception is just going to make you think it sounds way, way better, regardless of what you do. So the first thing to do is bring it down to the level of your mix. If you're using it as a mix reference, you're still making it hard for yourself because you're comparing a mastered version with a mix. But 
<clears throat> it's a more of a fair comparison. Um, and definitely when you're mastering, <clears throat> uh, you know, it, it depends. If you want to be as loud as Miley Cyrus, then you need to bring that mix in and you need to get your masters up to the same levels <clears throat> because that's what you're aiming for. But if you think like I do, that that's actually a bit of a waste of time and you want to find something that's uh, better optimized for all of the streaming services, then with your VU meter at minus 10 or with your if you're measuring LUFS, if you have the short-term loudness maxing out at minus 10 in the loudest sections, um, then you just turn the reference track down till it fits what you want, what your goal is, right? Rather than you trying to match it, you kind of go, well, I want to match it in everything except the loudness and the loudness I want is this, whatever it is. Could be even quieter, could be louder. Um, adjust the loudness first and then do your comparison. Uh, right. That's how you, that's another way, you know, combine that with the visual feedback and all the rest of it. And you're, you're on a really solid path of learning how stuff is supposed to sound and what you need to do to get your stuff to sound the way you would like it to. Yeah, we have a question that kind of ties into this. And James says, how much limiting is too much? Quote, I feel pressure from my clients to get pop levels, which are usually around negative eight to negative six LUFS. How do you know when you're just hitting the limiter too much and when you just got to say, you know, this is just way, way beyond what's acceptable. We can't go that that loud. Yeah. Okay. So two answers. My personal rule of thumb is the loudest sections at minus 10 LUFS short term. So you have confusing thing about LUFS is you have three versions. There's the momentary, which is this kind of instantaneous thing, short term, which is a bit more like a VU meter or an RMS meter, and then the integrated, which is a value for the whole thing. So you hear people talk about numbers for the integrated values. I'm not so sure about that. It's because uh, I mean, why would you make a death metal song and a folk tune the same? <laughs> why, why would you master both of those to minus 14? Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like if the streaming service does that for you, well, you're going to have to live with it. But actually, Spotify and Tidal and uh, well, definitely Spotify and Tidal have, have album mode, right? So if you, if you lay out a, a structure in terms of the dynamics of your songs, they will respect that. Um, if somebody listens in shuffle, well, then all bets are off. But um, you know, so yeah, aiming for a particular LUFS la level, I think is in terms of the overall, I think that's a red herring. But what works for me is to say, okay, I want the loudest bit to be no louder than minus 10. That's my personal thing. And um, uh, so something I maybe we could mention is that uh, if people are interested in this whole thing of streaming loudness, I set up a, a, meet, a website with meter plugs called loudnesspenalty.com. Um, it's a free website. You can go there, you just drag any audio file onto it. It won't upload it. It won't do anything with your audio. It will just measure what's going to happen to that song on YouTube, Spotify, Tidal, Pandora, all the rest of them. So if you, for me, if I upload, a, not upload, if I analyze a song there, it happens in the browser, it stays on your computer, and it says it's going to be turned down by 6 dBs, I'm thinking, well, then I could have backed off by 3, 4, 5, 6 dBs, made use of that extra peak headroom to get it sounding even better, now maybe that's not right for the song but i feel like that's an experiment i should at least do yeah um what i find is that when i follow this guideline of balanced eq minus 10 at the loudest sections usually when i measure it on that site i'm coming out with penalties of like minus one minus two um for the loudest stuff so it's getting turned down a little bit but right not like a disastrous amount and that means i'm making the maximum use of the the peak headroom that they've got available there it's going to sound just as loud as everything else right hey, if you upload it to so title and youtube don't turn things up so if you're way quieter when you upload you're going to stay way quieter and if loudness is important to you then that's something that you're going to have to kind of figure out um so that's my suggestion that's my uh recommendation if the client or whoever is asking you to go way louder than that i mean <laughs> Too much limiting is when it sounds bad. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that, I mean, you know, the, you can get ridiculously loud, really, and it not sound disastrous. You know, it's the question is what is bad, right? For me, I think distortion, just if it's not creative distortion and it's just for the sake of loudness, that to me is a, um, you know, a wasted opportunity. Um, 
and you do get that with heavy limiting so in terms of too much limiting i mean i would say if when i'm mastering if i'm seeing more than three or four dbs of limiting and particularly if it's extended like one of the nice things about something like the pro l is you can see the graph of when the limiter is active if it's a little dip three four dbs probably fine especially if it's, you know even at the end of the day use your ears and listen to it and does it sound good um but if it kind of is dipping down and it's it's ducking down for the whole drum beat or a whole bass note or a whole vocal note or something that's probably not going to sound great because a limiter is too aggressive at all to get that kind of clamp on the dynamics so another thing that i recommend on the course is sharing the load have some compression and some limiting you can use slower attack times in the compressor uh you kind of keep all that punch but you control the body of the sound with the compressor and then you just use the limiter to control the little peaks and that means you can use the limiter harder but it won't sound as bad because it's just operating on the really fast stuff um yeah so if i was going to have to go super loud that would be i'd be like okay so i'm going to have to use a higher ratio in the compressor it's going to be more aggressive but i don't have to use super fast attack times with the compressor right which is a real way to kind of dull the sound and suck the life out of it because yeah. i know that i've got a super clean limiter at the end of the chain that could deal with that stuff for me sometimes i might use some some soft clipping uh you know there's stuff like the uh Kazrog is a really affordable soft clipper there's one in t-rexes and they kind of they emulate the sort of the saturation effect you get with analog tape where they rather than just a hard slicing the top off they just round things off a little bit sometimes that can work if you want a more aggressive sound um so you know it's but but it's all about individual songs yeah you know, the funny thing is it's easier to make something that's actually kind of quiet so it's quite easy to make an acoustic ballad super super loud um whereas it's really hard to make a full-on edm mix or uh you know a, a a rock mix or metal or whatever <clears throat> really really loud because it's full of drums um you know it's full of dynamic contrasts anyway um it's probably got a ton of compression and things going on in there already so yeah it's just that much more challenging um because everything you do affects everything else and you don't have as much space to work so yeah i mean your three or four dbs is a good kind of rule of thumb I'm, i sometimes go beyond that and often yeah. i use less than that but it's uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about how does it sound? Um, right, right, exactly. Yeah, that was really insightful about sharing the load between the compressor and the limiter and how um, you can use a slow attack time on that compressor so that uh, you don't destroy the high-end clarity and the transients and such, but then um, let the limiter take care of that information. And uh, you mentioned that you cover that in your course. Um, this course is what called the home mastering masterclass and tell us a little bit about that because i'm actually pretty excited about this um i got a sneak peek of the opening material and the week one material and i've learned a lot i'm actually going to be going through it myself uh but why don't you introduce it ian okay sure um yeah so it's it's an eight week course so every week there's a new video where i'm mastering a different song um using different software different plugins different daws um <clears throat> and you basically get to be a kind of fly on the on the wall i i sort of show you what i'm doing it i explain why i'm doing it and how i'm doing it um and yeah it starts off fairly simple with just like some just a bit of i think the first one is probably just a level tweak and maybe a tiny eq adjustment and then you know by the time you get towards the end it's it's kind of into more the stuff that's uh the, the kind of the g whiz stuff you know parallel compression and stereo processing um and uh you know saturation in exciters and all that kind of stuff that actually i don't use that much but um you know and and it just kind of it builds up and um there are interviews that you can listen to with the people who submitted the songs to me some of the songs you can download the materials and have a go at mastering it yourself you can follow along i spread it out over eight weeks uh just i mean partly to avoid overwhelm right because otherwise it's this huge kind of thing you just dump on people and I, what i find is that people kind of watch the first couple of videos and then get distracted and never come back to it um so it just spaces it out it gives time for the, the kind of the ideas to set i guess um but also people can email me while the course is running um and i kind of i collect all the questions and then uh 
two or three times during the course, depending on how many people are on it, how many questions we get, I'll do a hangout like this where people can actually, they can join me in the hangout if they want, or they can ask questions in the chat. And I, I just go through those questions and answer them as best that I can. Um, and that's really cool because, you know, I find out what maybe people aren't getting from the course that they need to be. So I've improved it over the years. Um, I've been running it for a while now. I've had over a thousand people take it. So wow. um, I'm, I'm pretty soon now I'm going to do an update where I just kind of, because a lot of the software, the, they've had interface changes and all the rest of it. Um, so, and I mean, the whole loudness units topic, loudness units were just kind of coming into play when I first created the course. Um, so, but I tackle all of that kind of outside of the main videos as the course goes along. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, the, like I say, it ain't what you use, it's the way that you use it. The core concepts that run through all absolutely still apply. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great. There's a, there's a private Facebook group where people can come in and chat to other people on the course and, you know, kind of people start put submit tracks and kind of say, hey, what do you think of this? Or oh, I'm stuck with this and ask advice about bits of software because I haven't used everything. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a great community. It's about 800 people in the Facebook group now, um, you know, and, you know, there's a range as well. It's like, I mean, it is, a, it's a mastering course, but a lot of people have said to me that they feel they've, their mixing has benefited um, as a result of taking it either through sort of understanding more what can and can't be done in mastering or learning that they don't want to do it or, uh, but then there's other people who just love it and really run with the information. And there's, there's a few people who've even gone on to be professional mastering engineers after taking the course. I was interviewing Katie Tavini uh, on the podcast. I didn't realize, I, I was like, so how did you get your start in mastering? She said, well, I was listening to your YouTube videos and <laughs> took the home master, masterclass course, which is so great to hear, right? Because one of the things, well, one of the reasons I have the website and do the podcast and all the rest of it is these days, it's so hard for people to, you know, we you don't have the experience that I did where I went and worked in a pro studio and got to stand around the coffee machine and get a call, you know, another engineer in and go, what, what would you do with this? How, what can I, how can I improve that? Um, so yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of it. It's, um, it's, it's really good fun and uh, I get a great reaction to it. Um, yeah. Um, you know, just in the first week, just going through the material, you know, I, I really was able to fill in some gaps, um, that, there was some things that I either assumed wrongly or I didn't know. And like the whole thing about the floating point versus fixed point and exactly how that works and truncation error and that stuff that I, I never really dug into because you start reading up on that and it's like, Oh man, this is so dry of a topic. It's so boring. But um, the way you present it, the way you present it is very quick and um, you know, very, concise and and well explained um but it's just really cool to see your flow and you have a very basic flow of uh what is it levels and then eq compression and uh limiting and i'm not sure if i'm getting it right but then it just loops back around and it's a very simple concept that we get to see applied over and over for several different songs again like kind of a fly on the wall situation where you can watch the same process being applied uh, over and over again. Yeah, I mean, it's I, it's like I said, I think back at the beginning, I, I, it's, I genuinely believe that mastering is simple, which doesn't mean that it's easy. Um, and I'm a real minimalist. One of the things I like about, you know, I talked about adjusting the loudness first. One of the cool things about that is that if I have something that sounds really, really good and I adjust the loudness, maybe that's all it needs. I mean, it's it's pretty rare. Usually, there's a little tweak to the EQ, or you know, or maybe a bigger bigger adjustment or whatever. But every so often, you get an album and it's just sounding fabulous. And as far as I'm concerned, that song is just as mastered if all I do is turn it up and have a tiny little EQ tweak than the ones where I've gone in with the MSEQ and the saturation and the you know the tape emulation and all the rest of it. All of those things that you see kind of out there on YouTube where people have ten plugins in there their mastering chain. Sometimes I have 10 plugins in my master. Well, maybe not 10, but five or six, certainly. Right. But if I'm just as happy if there's one or two or three. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I, I'm kind of really kind of minimal about that. And I, that's something, that's another common comment is that people come in and go, what you were saying, it was so simple and it just got so much easier. Right. As soon as yeah. I just stripped away all of that, it's, it's so confusing with all the other stuff. You just hone in on the fundamentals. Um, and I think the other thing is I do, I put a lot of effort into trying to make things 
I'm not dumbing stuff down, right? It's called the Home Mastery Masterclass because most people who take it want to master at home, you know, or in a home situation and, and maybe don't want to go to a mastering engineer or can't afford to or whatever. But the, the, what I'm teaching is exactly what I do as a pro day in, day out and have done for my whole career. Um, so it's it's not dumbed down at all. Um, and yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of the best information that I can I can give. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree with that. He didn't dumb it down. I mean, uh, right from the first video, you know, like there was stuff he was talking about, and you kind of get this feeling that like, oh wow, okay, like I don't know quite like what was that again, and then he re re he kind of revisits the same terminology and topics, and and it really starts to grow on you. You know, you're kind of thrown right into the action. Yeah, it's um it's good information it's advanced but still able to be accessible from somebody that knows very little um i don't know a whole lot about mastering so it's gonna be really cool to work through this material um again to fill in some areas that i was unsure about but also just to get a perspective on what happens down the line you know if i know what needs to happen in mastering even if i'm not doing it or trying to do it then i can be a better mixer kind of like when we uh, are mixing a song and we're like, man, they should have moved the mic on this, you know, like, why didn't they go in and move the mic? And that experience of mixing makes us a better uh, engineer. And so it's just giving me a really cool perspective and a little bit different angle on things. I should mention that if you're interested in this masterclass, uh, the link is down below in the description. It's also just creativesoundlab.tv slash Ian, I-A-N. And there's also a, a code you can put in to get a discount. That's just CSL as Creative Sound Lab. So CSL, you put in that code and you get a discount on the Home Mastering Masterclass. Um, what is that discount again? And, and how does it work with the different uh, you know levels of the course? Right. So it's, it's 80 pounds off, but there's... Uh, three different options you can do for the course. There's one that's kind of called the ultimate that includes uh, a one-to-one -one mastering consultation with me. Um, but uh, the the course itself, uh, it's basically a 32% discount, so a third off. Um, you can also go for what I call the enhanced bundle, which is the course plus home mastering compression and home mastering EQ. So it's kind of, and I, I, I would say this, but I think that's the best possible way to do the course if you're if you're into this because. You know, I I try not to duplicate the content uh, any more than I have to. So there's a, there's a those two are really deep dives into the topic of compression and using limiting as well, um, for example. Um, but yeah, so you add up the total value of those, um, and then you look at because there's already a discount built in if you go for the bundle. But then you add in this, the code, and you save forty five percent. So it's almost half off for the three. And I think I haven't worked this out, but I'm pretty sure that if you do that, you basically get at least one or two of the products effectively for free. So, um, you know, it's, hopefully that helps that. Um, so the course starts on Friday, the first week's content. If people want to sign up now, then they get all of that introductory content you were talking about. And then the first week's content comes out on Friday. Um, but we, obviously it's Wednesday already. So the code is going to run until Sunday night. Um, if people want to, you know, take a look at my site or the YouTube channel and check it out a bit more, find out a bit more about it, maybe listen to some episodes of the podcast or whatever. Um, yeah, so that, hopefully that gives people enough time to decide if they would like to give it a try or not. Yeah, I mean, um, your latest video about the resolution of 24-bit, I mean, that that's a really good example on your public YouTube channel that people can check out about just kind of Ian's style of teaching, the power of how he teaches. Um, it's just straight into the point and right to the gut of of what he's getting at and it's it's really well done it's really convincing um so yeah if you want to check it out i'll be doing it uh along anybody that wants to join me uh, i'll be a part of the facebook group and this is just going to be a really cool experience over the next couple of months that uh i'm really looking forward to it yeah thanks Ryan. it'd be great to have you yeah so um so yeah, I, I guess this pretty much wraps it up. Um, I don't see many questions still coming in, but uh, Ian, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it was cool just to kind of shoot the breeze about 
mastering and, and different concepts. Uh, anything else that, that you want to add or, or mention? No, I don't think so. I mean, thanks thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been great. I've, been, I've enjoyed it. It has some great questions. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be great if anybody watching this would like to try the course, but there's also a ton of free stuff on my site. If you go to productionadvice.co.uk uh, and click, there's a mastering button near the top. Um, there's a whole list of free resources there. There's a free email course. Um, so, um, yeah, be, you know, and, and come and connect with me on Facebook, on Twitter. You know, I always enjoy talking to people. I, I try and answer questions when I get them. Um, it's, uh, I, I get a ton these days. But, uh, yeah, and, you know, if I can help people get better results recording, mixing, mastering music, then, you know, I'm really happy. So thanks for the, for the opportunity. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, I, I know we couldn't cover all the questions. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to it. Um, but yeah, check out Ian's channel, check out his website. It's actually really great stuff. I think it's some of the most, um, it, it's, it's just, it's some of the slickest tutorials out there. Um, he said that he like edits it and stuff, but I couldn't tell. <laughs> so I thought he actually was like, you know, one take wonder that just like sits down and just nails it. But, uh, it's really good stuff. Check out Ian's channel, and if you want to check out the Home Mastering Masterclass, the link is below. The code that you want to use for the discount is CSL. Okay, guys. Well, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off, so let's be in touch, and hope you guys enjoyed it. Cheers, Ryan.